Good evening. 30 years ago, if I told you that I would take some fruit, squeeze the juice of it into a cup, stick in a straw, and charge you five times the amount than what the fruit would have cost on its own, you would have thought I was cuckoo. 30 years ago, if I told you I was going to give you five times less food and charge you five times more because I had something called a Michelin star over my door, you also would have thought I was crazy. And you probably would have tried to remind me that Michelin make tires. <laughs> That's 30 years ago. Let's look 30 years into the future and step into my restaurant, my big idea for the future. You step into my restaurant, a waiter takes your coat, you bring one of your loved ones for a nice dinner out. You seat it for a pre-dinner drink. A waiter brings over a small device. You insert your finger. You leave a drop of blood behind. The waiter takes it away. You're you finish your pre-dinner drink. You're taken to your table. Your waiter has a chat with you. He doesn't just say, how are you, in a kind of a, I don't really want to know how you are, I just want your order. He asks how you are, and he engages in a very in-depth conversation with you for a number of minutes. He then leaves, talks to the chef, who then starts to prepare your meal. What's different in this experience is that he hasn't said, can I take your order? He hasn't even shown you a menu. I'm going to leave my restaurant for a moment, and I'm going to talk about food. I'm going to talk about what's happened to food in the last 50 years. And in order to address that question, let's start by asking, what's on your dinner plate 50 years ago, and what might be on your dinner plate now? Well, 50 years ago, it was probably meat and two veg. It was vegetables, well-grown, prepared freshly. It was meat made for, taken from animals that were well-fed and well-grown. And it was a hearty, nutritious meal. There are endless potentials to what might be on your dinner plate today. They vary from meat and two veg to anything that may have come out of a packet. In fact, if you watch those horrendous documentaries that appear on the UK channels, you will see that some people consider taking boxes out of the freezer and placing the contents on a tray and cooking a dinner is considered to be dinner on a plate. So there's a massive difference to what we might have been eating 50 years ago and what we potentially might be eating now. So what's the difference? Apart from a lot of ingredients and a lot of processing, there is a major difference in two key elements, fats and sugars. And we're gonna talk a little bit about fats. Now, fats have a really bad name. All fats are not bad. In fact, cells need fat in their membrane in order to be able to keep them fluid and to be able to work properly. So there are good fats and there are bad fats. What's happened in the last 50 years is that we've changed the amount of fat we consume, but we've also changed the type of fat we consume. Two key things happened in those 50 years. One was the evolution of the trans fats that we all know now to be extremely bad. When trans fats were first put on the market as a healthy alternative to animal fats, everybody bought into this idea and, every, and the, the sale of trans fats and margarines and, and, and uh, products that contain them outsold everything that contained butter for a very, very long time. What else happened? Well, we were told we were all eating too much fat and we needed to reduce our fat intake and companies made fat-free and low-fat versions of everything. Now, why didn't all of this stuff taste like cardboard? Because fat tastes good. Because when they took all the fat out, they loaded it up with sugar, which is actually quite addictive. So we changed what we were eating in terms of the amount of fat and the type of fat. So what else happened while we were changing our food? Well, our incidence of chronic disease went through the roof. Diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, all went through the roof in that period of time that we were changing our diet radically. In fact, the incidence and risk of diabetes went from one in 30, which was about a million um, in, in, in a various part of America, to 22 million, which is a one in three risk. And that's a massive increase over the space of 15 to 20 years. So we changed our food and disease went up. So why am I interested in fat? I'm an immunologist. Well, apart from the fact that it tastes really good, um, saturated fats, which are fats that you get from animals, are actually recognised by your immune system. So your immune system has a sensor and detection device that tells it when a bacteria or a virus or a parasite or a fungus invades your body. And saturated fats can be recognised by the same device that recognises when you have a bacterial infection, even infections like E. coli. 
So saturated fats are recognized by your immune system and they activate the similar kind of response. They activate something called inflammation. Now inflammation also has a really bad name, but inflammation is a really good thing if you have an infection and you need to get better. But inflammation is a bad thing in the absence of infection where you get damage to the tissue because of constant inflammation. So if you can imagine a lot of people that have huge amounts of intake of saturated fats, which is what happens in terms of obese people, you find that there is a, a, a scenario in place where you're just activating your immune system over and over, just at a low grade, continuously over a period of time, and you're constantly driving inflammation. The type of research that we do in DCU, some of which is around ingredients in food and how we can use it to change your immune system and alter your health status. And we do a lot of work on good fats. So we're trying to find fats that we can put into foods that will tip the balance the other way, the beneficial way, that will suppress inflammation and stop it getting out of control, that will try and combat the effects of saturated fatty acids on your immune system. So why would we like to suppress inflammation? Well, now we know that inflammation and some of the processes that drive inflammation are responsible for the cardiovascular disease, the diabetes, and even the cancer. We know now that very early on in those diseases that there are inflammatory processes that take place that drive the, those diseases and all of the symptoms and pathology and damage associated with those diseases. So if we can use food and fats and good ingredients to try and combat that, we may be able to incorporate additional things in our diet that will be able to reduce our risk with the, the environment that we live in and the food that we eat to be able to change our immune response and manipulate it for benefit. And there's loads of examples of this. This is just one. Some of the other work that we do in terms of ingredients is trying to retrain your immune system with ingredients. We work with infant formula companies that are trying to find novel ingredients that you can give to an infant or a baby who has an allergy to cow's milk protein and you can give them ingredients that will retrain their immune system to be able to tolerate protein. So this is just a couple of examples of the power of food on your immune system and how that might impact on your overall health. So, the link between food, health and disease is very clear. So let's go back to my restaurant. So, the finger prick test that you took when you came in has given the people in the restaurant information about your glucose levels, your insulin, your vitamins, your minerals, your iron, your inflammatory status, your cholesterol, your good and your bad fats, okay? The waiter that took your information was a medically qualified technician and what he was really taking was a clinical history. He went into the back, the chef designed a personalized meal for you for the best of enhancing your health. And this kind of personalized food, as opposed to the, what you might have heard, which is personalized medicine, is a real possibility. And it's research, like I do, on food and ingredients and how we can use them to change your immune response creates the possibility of this restaurant. So, 30 years is a long time to wait for my restaurant, but you can change what's on your dinner plate tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.